I'm Larry Fedorik, and this is Later That Same Life. On this weekly podcast, topics, discussions, stories from our lives. Season 5, Chapter 6. God save the Queen! Recently, we have witnessed an unprecedented celebration. What a spectacle! All in honor of Queen Elizabeth II and her Platinum Jubilee. As you know by now, Platinum means she has sold over one million albums. Most of us witnessed her Golden Jubilee, 50 years, and her Diamond Jubilee, 60 years. We thought those were a big deal, and they were. But now, 70 years on the throne. That's Platinum. The Queen has looked a little more frail of late. She's 96. Conceivably, though, we could be celebrating her 80 years on the throne. And by the way, that would be Oak. Oak. I guess after that many years, you care less about precious metals and gems, and you're just happy to get wood. At 70 years wearing the top crown, she holds the royal record shattering the previous record of 63 years held by her great-grandmother, Queen Victoria. Elizabeth is like the Gretzky of nobility, the Michael Jordan of monarchs. 95% of the world's population has only ever known one Queen of England and the British Commonwealth, Elizabeth II. While she reigned in this on her Platinum Jubilee, there have been 14 different U.S. presidents, 12 Canadian Prime Ministers, 15 UK PMs, 7 Popes, and 7 Archbishops of Canterbury. One Queen. Lizzie the Deuce. Remarkable. Plus, this record, you know, 70 years on the throne that everybody's talking about, it'll likely never be broken. Heir to the throne is Charles. He's already 73 years old. Also, this will be the last Queen of England that we'll see for a good long while. It's mostly men after this. Next in line is Charles, then his son, William, then William's oldest, George. Within the laws of lineage, the British royals always prioritized the sons. Do you know that only changed in 2012? When a decree was signed that would allow Will and Kate's second oldest, Charlotte to be in line to rule. 2012. Before that, Charlotte would have just been skipped over because she's a girl. I wonder, though, what if she identified as a man? Well, anyway, in line to the throne, it now goes Charles, William, his kids in order, George, Charlotte, and Louis, then Harry. Harry is sixth in line, unless, of course, his older brother decides to have more kids then they would jump the queue in front of Harry. Line of succession is so strange. Right now, after Harry, it would be Harry's kids. Then it goes to the Queen's second oldest son, Andrew. Can you imagine? Then Andrew's kids. Then his brother, Edward. His kids. Then the Queen's daughter, Anne, and her brood. Well, there's at least 63 people who have a royal number after their name. Charles, William, and George are one, two, and three. After that, I don't think anybody else has an actual shot at the crown. Think about it. By the time we get through Charles and Willie, George will probably be having kids, and they will automatically get top ranking. It's crazy. I always wonder if it's a status among the royals themselves. Where are you in line to the throne? I'm 13th. Yes, well, I'm 9th. So take a hike, pal. You may only approach the buffet once I am finished seconds. So, with centuries of this testosterone, how did this young girl named Elizabeth become Queen of England? Well, it was really due to a horny young prince who had a penchant for older women, especially the married ones. The history is interesting, and not just because it's a royal family, but because history is interesting. A lot of this will fall into place for anyone who has seen The King's Speech, starring Colin Firth. We have to go back to George V, 
king from 1910 to 1936. He was a beloved monarch, had led the kingdom through the First World War. He was relatively accessible and seemed to be humble. But at home, apparently, he was a tyrant. He had two sons, Edward and Albert, who were so scared of the old man, they would literally faint at the thought of being disciplined by him after committing some minor infraction around the house. Living under this fear, younger Albert, Bertie, began to develop a stutter. When George the V died in January of 1936, his son Edward automatically became king, although there was never an official coronation. You see, Edward had fallen in love with one Wallace Simpson, a twice-divorced American woman. That's like three strikes against you. This was against the kingly handbook of rules and regs. Edward had to choose between being king and Wallace Simpson. Famously, he chose her and abdicated the throne. By the way, the two were married and lived in exile in Paris until his death in 1972. She passed in 1986. So there was young Bertie, the stuttering second son, who never ever thought about being king, never studied for it or prepared for it in any way. Suddenly he was thrust into the role in 1936. He took the name George VI, and he would work tirelessly to become a proper king. Most of us would remember, thanks to the film The King's Speech, how he strived to inspire the British citizenry and military during the conflict with Hitler's Germany in World War II. For the second time in the lives of most of us, we are at, at war. Bertie had married a young woman named Elizabeth back in 1923. Interestingly, this young and eligible woman was once thought to be the perfect mate for Edward. But remember, Edward was not really interested in young women around his own age. But through these connections, Elizabeth eventually met Albert and found out what a marvelous man he was. They married in April of 23, and three years later, almost to the day, April 21st, 1926, had a daughter. They called her Elizabeth. Four years later, another daughter, Margaret. And note that in the day, if they had had a third child and it was a son, he would automatically become the next heir to the throne. They did not. Just the two girls. A young family, and suddenly Colin Firth becomes the king. Well, Bertie, George the Sixth. By all accounts, Bertie doted on the children, especially Elizabeth. She blossomed into a beautiful young woman and in 1947 married the man of her dreams, Prince Philip. They had two kids, Charles and Anne, and lived a luxurious royal life, but also a pretty normal one. Like her father, Elizabeth didn't really expect to take the throne, at least not for many, many years. Her father was in his young 50s. In February of 1952, and somewhat unexpectedly, the king died in the same home he was born in. Complications from pneumonia. Long live the queen. As we know now, she took that line pretty seriously. Bertie's widow became known as the queen mum, gracious and beloved individual. She passed in 2002 at age 101. The queen and her consort, Philip, had two more children after coronation, Andrew and Edward. Philip and Elizabeth were married 73 and a half years until his passing in 2021 at age 99. You know, he was just two months short of getting the centenary telegram from the Queen. During this time of her Platinum Jubilee, there are at least two schools of thought. One, almost all of us love the Queen. Two, less and less of us think very much about the royal family. The queen herself, Elizabeth the person, I don't think we have an issue with her and the way she has comported herself or executed her royal duties over these decades. Royal duties, be that what they may, 
By many accounts, she is a decent human being, and as one royal commentator put it, her image and position represents the security of a known relationship. As I said earlier, countless world leaders over the years, one queen. Many people love the queen, and that's what all the pomp and pageantry has been about. Her. Her 70 years. The second point, however, is the very idea of a royal family in the 21st century. Seems super outdated, doesn't it? There are about two dozen royal families still hanging around various parts of the world. The only ones that have any real power are the Emirate nations like Saudi Arabia and Qatar, and a couple of smaller African nations. Many others like Belgium, the Netherlands, Sweden, Japan, et al. have no real power. And like the British royals are ceremonial figureheads. Prince Albert II does run Monaco, and technically Vatican City is a kingdom run by a monarch, King Popus the Senile. As far as the Brit royals, while the current bunch of pasty white Anglo-Saxon Protestants can trace their bloodlines back about a thousand years, and they don't have to use Ancestry.com. Around the year 1000, that's when a king was a king, and Groovin was Groovin, William the Conqueror, absolute power. These were the Middle Ages, but there was no middle class. Just kings and the starving subjects. Slowly, the people, under the leadership of guys like Robin Hood, challenged this unfair system. Well, Robin Hood was a fictional character, but you get the gist. It took a couple hundred years, but finally King John introduced the Magna Carta in 1215, an early Bill of Rights for free men. Things got a little better, but it wasn't until the 1600s when people really began to revolt. They demanded a government and they abolished the royal family. A few people even left for the States and formed a new England. In France, they also tore down the throne. A few years later, England did restore the royal family, but only symbolically. They have been a powerless extravagance ever since. Nothing more than a salute to historical culture for the last 400 years. And this has been Millennia in a Minute. Now back to our regularly scheduled program already in progress. Yeah, so why have them? I don't know. Keeping them around in England makes more sense than, say, Canada or Australia. This royal family is really more a part of British history than that of any of the nations they conquered or colonized. Right now, 53 countries, including Canada, are part of something called the Commonwealth of Nations, formerly known as the British Commonwealth, with the stink of the British Empire all over it. This was not a group of volunteer nations getting together for a trade pact or a union of any kind. These were royal subject nations. During the reign of Elizabeth II, almost all have declared their independence from the empire. The queen signed off on all of them, like she had any choice. Most recent country to do so, Barbados. Canada signed off in 82, but we are still technically a constitutional monarchy. The Queen is our head of state, again with no real power, and we do this, in my opinion, in deference to Her Majesty, the nice lady we all like. Once Charles is the king, time to cut the cord. Australia is thinking about it. Other nations, too. Sever that last formal tie. Commonwealth is such a strange choice for a name because there isn't a commonwealth in the commonwealth. There are rich nations and poor nations, and the organization has been accused, like any other world pact of countries, of rich manipulating poor for their own benefit, just like the British Empire did. 
Speaking of wealth, by the way, the Queen is estimated to be worth around $600 million. As far as the richest people in the world go, she's in the top 400. The royals personally own Balmoral Castle and the Sandringham Estates, and whatever else she's got her money in. That is a closely guarded secret. No one really knows if the Queen's got Twitter stock, or gold bars, or shares in McDonald's. Windsor Castle, where she lives, Buckingham Palace, along with a lot of other items of great value, like book collections, and jewels, etc. They are held by the sovereign, but owned by the state. The state also gives the family money to run things. You know, put gas in the Range Rover, pick up some tea and crumpets on your way home. Much of that money comes back in tourism dollars. If you are a working royal, you receive a significant stipend for cutting ribbons at openings, supporting charities, and shaking hands at a garden party. It's a living. It's all a little bizarre, isn't it? It's like an old game of pretend we agree to play as grown-ups. I guess that was fine for a while, but now I feel we are like the people from the 1600s at the beginning of the Age of Enlightenment. They were asking, why do we have kings and queens ruling the world? Why can't we just rule ourselves? And now we're asking, why do they have any role at all? The royal family's historical culture is now just a celebrity culture. Means less and less every day. Why do we have kings and queens? Just for fun? Because even though most of them have no real power, we hold them up as royal. A bloodline that is better than most? Simply because of to whom they were born? I get it, I mean, people are born into rich families all the time. And many of those will get a leg up because of nepotism or family wealth. I don't expect to change all of that. But royalty? That seems a real antique, passé designation. You know, there's squire, esquire, knight, baron, count, viscount, earl, marquis, duke, royal duke, prince, king. That's the pecking order. Eek, time to stop this facade. It's prejudice, it's colonial, and racist. Hey, UK, and mostly Britain. If you want to have a royal family, palaces, and the changing of the guard, do it. I guess it's good for tourism. The royals are your amusement park. Ride the teacups. See if you can get a picture with Donald Duck. Donald Duck, by the way, is a Prince Andrew reference. Because neither of them apparently like to wear pants. For the rest of the world, it's time to move on, in my opinion. In Canada, I don't think we should have a queen or a king as our head of state even as a formality. No governor general. We can keep some of the names, I guess, but eventually some people are going to have a problem with the terms British Columbia or Prince Edward Island. Hey, maybe we could change Victoria Day to Elizabeth Day. After all, she is the new record holder. After that, we can decide what paintings and statues we want to leave up. But otherwise, let's move on. Or call this what it is. Living in the past. <laughs> Even Harry figured it out. Time to get out of here, he said. California is the place I ought to be. Loaded up a truck and he moved to Beverly. Now he didn't leave the family. He just left the family business. I almost, almost feel sorry for Charles. He waited so long. Now to one day soon be king of nothing. Later That Same Life is written, voiced, and produced by Larry Fedoric. LarryFedoric37 at gmail.com. Subscribe to Larry's podcast YouTube channel. Get automatic notifications with each new episode.